This has been a very hot topic, partially uh, uh, because we've learned a lot over the last couple of years from what the Europeans have taught us uh, and their outcomes, as well as uh, new techniques that we've described here in the United States. So one of the biggest challenges is when we try to predict who's going to recur, as soon as you add bone loss into the equation and start adding up the numbers that we take into consideration, say, for the instability severity index, which is essentially a 10-point scale, all you have to do is have a Hill Sachs lesion, glenoid bone loss, and be less than 20, and you have a greater than 70% uh, recurrence rate. So it doesn't take much, and that's why this is on our radar. Uh, the incidence of glenoid bone loss is, is highly variable, and it all it's all basically takes into consideration how we actually define what glenoid bone loss is. But basically, suffice it to say, it was probably Steve Burkhart, and at the time his fellow Joe DeBeer, who really showed us that if we ignore glenoid bone loss, the recurrence rates with arthroscopic stabilization are exponentially greater. And the basic reason is that if you just think about as a golf ball on a, t on a tee and chop off the... 20% of that tee, how difficult it is to keep that golf ball on the tee. That's the analogy I use for my patients. So very difficult problem to manage just with soft tissue repair alone, especially in the setting of all the other clinical problems such as recurrence, uh, the level of trauma that went into the first dislocation, and so forth. And we started out saying, well, look, maybe it's 25%. That's when we should just do a ladder J. And it's not a cookbook approach. It's not uh, just the bone loss, but there's all those other independent variables, which I'll allude to. And now that number of 25% is even in, uh, refutable, and we've gone down in 19%, and the military have taught us maybe we should go down to 17% or 15%. So it's probably less about the percent than it is the clinical scenario that drives the decision making. And it either happens acutely at the time of the first dislocation or through attritional bone loss through repetitive instability. That case that Nick showed this morning, you know, truth be told, the, the, the young man says, well, I've dislocated two times. I would venture to say there was probably a lot more going on there that was unbeknownst clinically. It just has to be that way. Attritional bone loss is what we most commonly see. The acute stuff we often manage differently, but when we get these patients who are coming out at night, coming out in their sleep, coming out with low arm uh, positions of abduction, those are patients you have to have that on your radar. Now, x-rays can be very misleading. There are a number of views that have been described, but most of us are going on to advanced imaging. And to date, I would say CT scan is what we use most commonly. And the, if you're a surgeon in the room, it's a, three to, it's a 3D CT scan with thin slices with humeral subtraction. And that will basically give you a sense of what's going on in the glenoid. And then you can do your calculations, if you will, based upon some parameters we've learned from MRI analysis. MRI can be used, and we basically can draw this circle around the inferior two-thirds of the glenoid and say, how do we quantify the bone loss? Basically, we use this inferior two-thirds circle method where we compare it to the contralateral side or we just compare it to normal and say it should be a circle and we can start calculating percentages of bone loss with the center being essentially the bare area. And arthroscopically, like Nick showed you this morning, is really the way we can determinally evaluate this. But you obviously want to have a good idea before you're going in. And it's not just going to be that CT scan or that MRI. It's going to be the clinical scenario. And we can use a probe to say, well, here's the bare area, virtually the center of the glenoid. What's the percentage of bone loss from the front to that bare area compared to what the normal bone is from the center to the back of the glenoid? So that's one other way that's been taught to us, and Burkhart has popularized that method. So now we get to say, uh, to, the, to the point, well, how do we actually make decisions on this? This was the sort of initial treatment algorithm that was uh, one of which was published in JAOS in 2009, and I've, I would say it really has been modified. You know, if you look at it, go to the far right there and you say greater than 25% bone loss and look at those options, take those options on the far right, and I would move them to the middle because that's really what we're now thinking. If it's an acute situation and it's minimal bone loss, you can do acute repair and or arthroscopic stabilization. But if you're dealing with significant bone loss with low energy required to dislocate the shoulder now, multiple recurrences, arm position, say, below shoulder level, even with the arm at the side, and CT and MRI that shows some degree of bone loss, sometimes any degree of bone loss, that's one that's pushing us over the edge to say, look, if there's a fragment there, you can try to incorporate it in a chronic setting. In an acute setting, you might as well try to fix that. If they have no fragment and they have attritional bone loss and you're even as little as 15%, but all those other clinical variables are operational, then you ought to be thinking about a bone bony procedure and not a soft tissue procedure. So these are sort of the warning signs. Young age, the contact overhead athlete, that's the one who puts themselves back at risk. You could argue take all the same variables, 
and take a patient who's not an overhead athlete who's basically fell down the stairs, dislocated his or her shoulder, has a little bit of bone loss, you might succeed if that patient isn't involved in contact overhead sports with a soft tissue operation. Take that same, all those same independent variables and put them in a collision sport risk category, that's one you'd probably reduce your threshold to do a bony procedure. If they've had chronicity, multiple dislocations, mid ranges of motion, the shoulder's coming out. They say they're coming out at night, or it's a revision situation like Tony's case, those are cases where you start thinking about bone loss. Most of the time, the problem is on the glenoid. Now, Nick showed us the remplissage procedure, which is a great bailout if you've got a little bit of bone loss in the higher risk athlete where you don't wish to go to an open procedure doing a bony proce doing a bony procedure. It's rare that we need to do bipolar treatment. Most of the time, the problem can be solved by the glenoid-based uh, treatment. Now, what should happen most of the time, this is a patient where who has a very vertical, fairly significant Hill Sachs lesion and can dislocate out the front very easily, right? So it's got a, a, an anterior drawer sign we're viewing arthroscopically. Very easy to get them locked out the front. But if you just repair the glenoid sign and ignore the Hill Sachs, which most of the time we can do, if there's no or minimal glenoid bone loss, doing a soft tissue procedure makes that Hill Sachs lesion irrelevant. Now, Kevin asked, I think, about uh, uh, Hill Sachs size. It may have Size may be important, but it's also orientation and placement of it. So there's lots of variables that sometimes we can just use the intraoperative assessment to, to make a decision of how to manage it. It is very rare that we will ever consider allograft treatment of that Hill Sachs lesion. My personal belief is that it almost never has to be considered unless there's a fractured, fractured dislocation, impaction injury. But from a reconstruction point of view, it's very rare that it has to be considered, and we can manage it on the glenoid side. So the decision making when you're considering glenoid versus humeral the options on the glenoid side are, as we discussed, arthroscopic repair, latter J, you can use an iliac crest, and you can use a fresh allograft. On the humeral side is remplissage. You can use a fresh allograft in extreme situations, and then some type of limiting resurfacing operation like uh, a metal insert, uh, inset implant. Most of these defects are combined and can, in fact, be managed with glenoid treatment. Now, if you have an acute injury with a bony fragment, the literature is very good. If we get that bony fragment back, even when it's not that gratifying because it's fragmented in, in multiple pieces, you can actually get that patient to a successful outcome with an acute dislocation with a bony fragment that's repaired arthroscopically. If all else fails and you have to open it, that's fine. Just re restore the anatomy. That's our objective. Coracoid transfer has been described in a variety of ways, and what Tony showed you this morning was a ladder J. Abristo was basically one of the first generations where the tip of the coracoid was transferred with the tendon. Some people talk about transferring the tendon only. Some talk about transferring bone only. Um, now, basically, I'd say the standard, at least in the United States, is some form of a ladder J. There are lots of decisions that we talked about this morning. We really do bank upon that sling effect, um, where you make your subscap split. Suffice to say, Tony mentioned you can go up higher, but it becomes a much more difficult operation when you have lots of subscap that's remaining and trying to do that dissection. So I think we're generally safe with a superior two-thirds, inferior one-third. And essentially what we're trying to do is place a coracoid, extend that golf tee so the golf ball has more room that it needs to travel before it goes off the edge, and then belt and suspenders by having a conjoined tendon, which gives you that sling effect and abduction and external rotation. And that's really why it works. The results of a latter J are actually been quite good, some of the best in the literature, uh, with very high satisfaction rates. And I will tell you that most of us, outside of a patient with, say, an Ehlers Danlos or a non-union where they get displaced from that fragment, rarely see a recurrence with latter J. But there are some problems long term. People cite complication rates, which I think are, uh, are, are, have been high based upon uh, a high-risk population. Certainly, if you measure neurologic function like J.P. Warner and others have done intraoperatively, we're going to see some changes. But the reality is that the complication rate, and we've shown this, is actually very, very low, but there is a learning curve. The biggest complication that's driven us to consider other options has been the fact that some of these patients will go on to develop osteoarthritis long term. And I think much of that can be prevented by proper surgical technique, avoiding overconstraint, and making that graft flush and not offset. But there are other options and you kind of need to know about it. The iliac crest, an uh, allograft or autograft can be utilized to restore with an intraarticular uh, procedure. You don't get the sling effect, but it gives you bony reconstitution of the glenoid. The results of that have been pretty good, and some of the work that we've done in our lab basically has taught us that no matter what graft you're going to use, just make sure it's flush. If you want to restore normal glenohumeral dynamics or biomechanics, make that graft flush versus offset. Probably leads to the lowest chance of getting arthritis downstream. This is a technique that Matt uh, Preventure has described and that uh, we've, we will occasionally do with high degrees of bone loss, and that's using a fresh distal tibia, and it has a match radius of curvature to the proximal humerus. Uh, recently, the results uh, have been uh, presented at uh, a couple of national meetings, and it's been published in arthroscopy.
Basically, what we've shown biomechanically is that compared to other procedures, Latter-J, for example, we can reestablish glenohumeral biomechanics by using a distal tibia in a very similar way and sometimes in an improved way compared to the Latter-J. The whole idea is we can give cartilage and bone and potentially reduce the chance of osteoarthritis downstream. As I mentioned, the results now and clinical outcomes are going to be reported, and that's really what we needed. I think we've had a few issues of non-unions. Clearly, an allograft bone is a much greater challenge to heal than autograft bone, so very large reconstructions are fraught with more potential issues of non-union or resorption. But surprisingly, we had 89% healing, uh, and uh, we had uh, a very high success rate. So our basic algorithm, and we'll, I want to hear what Tony's response is, but I think we're all coming down to the extent that if patients have pain, very large areas of bone loss as a revision situation or large areas of attritional loss, we might consider uh, distal tibia, but still the coracoid is the primary go-to. So my approach is basically suspicion of glenoid bone loss. If they fail previous surgeries, frequent recurrence, reduce force to dislocate, and they have marked apprehension or relocation, those are situations where I will often consider a ladder J. I, I, my personal preference is two 3.5 millimeter screws. Uh, typically, they're 32 to 34s, and I do lag by application with over drilling the coracoid and a smaller drill hole in the glenoid. And then I'll use distal tibia with large areas of bone loss or volumes of bone loss, especially when pain is a very uh, significant component. So in conclusion, the coracoid is associated with excellent long-term results, but some morbidity. There's been reports of nerve issues. We've had a couple, but they've been very rare, and they're typically transient. There is that potential for osteoarthritis, but I would say that if we do a look forward with contemporary techniques, special attention to avoid over-tightening as you close, make that graph flush, we will probably see a reduction in osteoarthritis in our prospective evaluation. Iliac crest is a good alternative. The recurrence rates in arthritis may increase over time, and there is some morbidity of harvesting the iliac crest from the patient. And the distal tibia is another option, does have some, uh, it avoids that issue of donor site morbidity. I think it may be best for large volume glenoid bone loss. Biomechanically, it has been shown to be an excellent option. Theoretically, it might reduce the chance of osteoarthritis developing long term. But graft availability and cost and so forth still remains a consideration. And I want to thank you for your attention, just bring you to this, uh, 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 make you aware of this course that will occur in January, uh, February transition in Park City, which is an, uh, an ANA AOSSM AOS ski course that's 19 years in the running, but the first time all societies have joined together. Uh, basically, it's case-based learning uh, with the physical therapy component that Kevin Wilk will uh, highlight and uh, head up. And uh, also, there's an ultrasound component to learn diagnostic and uh, uh, therapeutic ultrasound. So we hope to see some of you there. Thank you very much.